Mm, yeah, but, but soon it will. Why is um no no I I'm yeah this is perfect perfect the settings are never been this good exactly yeah, fantastic oh my God yeah one more thing so that means hey ah so is it another so so. Duplicate. Yep, perfect. Now it's perfect. And you came. I mean, you guys came. I'm surprised. Okay, so what do you say? Should we get started? Yeah. Like I say, I'm gonna close already at 1.30, so I need to have a lunch today. Yeah, because I have a meeting with you at uh, two o'clock. Two o'clock. Very good. See ya. Hey, how is your life? You're enjoying the weather and everything? Yeah, it's, yeah this, is, uh, this is pretty much uh, how the summer is in Finland. So, no, no, this is uh, like good summer weather, so it <laughs> so so you can difference that the summer from the winter that there's a less snow, but that's not necessarily the case. Like this summer seems to be more snow than in the winter time. <laughs> so you never know. You cannot really tell. Daylight is longer. That's the way to know. That's the way to know. Okay. So hey, uh, what I'm planning to do today is that I'm gonna spend a little bit of time in the beginning concerning the carrier counseling. Uh, it's not going to be a lengthy explanation. It's not going to be nowhere near as lengthy as this story. Uh, and see that my camera is frozen. So just a second, I need to put it back on. Hmm. Maybe this cable extension or something that sometimes seems that uh, camera is not willing to work properly. Okay, so I need to do this. Then I need to do that. Okay, should be back on. And I need to connect myself again to the overhead projector like this. Very good. Nice. Okay, so like I said, I'm going to spend some time in the beginning to explain about the carrier counseling. So it's not a lengthy explanation, but few notes about the carrier counseling. And that's something that is more about what's the difference between academia and industry. Something like what difference, what, what is the difference between those two career opportunities and what is a statistically the most uh, obvious way to go. And then later, it's gonna be perhaps in a, two weeks time, I'm going to explain more about how is a life in academia, a little bit about how is a life in industry too, but more about academia because, well, I'm working in academia, so I have a lot of uh, history in academia, but I do have a history in industry too. I don't know if you guys are aware of this, but I do, I do. Okay, so uh, we get started from the career counseling, then there's going to be a short story about how is that we can get the stresses out from the multi-body simulation when we're using flexible bodies, and then a little bit about how the fatigue, and this is uh, when we're going to discuss about what is it you learn from the core simulation, not simulation, but fatigue of welded structures, or I don't know what's the title of the course. Yeah, so it's a fatigue of welded structure, really. Very nice, very nice. So looking forward to that discussion, a little bit about uh, nonlinear finite term and method, large deformation, something that I would like you also to be aware of is uh, isotermetric analysis. Another method in the uh, family of the finite element method, which having a big promise, it seems to be something that helps to overcome some of the, the limitations of the conventional finite element modeling. A limitation that is very good at is that it can give a better description of geometry, which is a 
important in some of the contact problems. Maybe that maybe also helps to make a more efficient meshing because meshing is typically the part of the modeling that takes takes off a lot of time. You know, building this finite element network mesh top of the structure, how that can be enhanced in terms of isogeometric analysis that I will explain to you. Okay, so uh, now then the next week is going to be visiting lecture about the biomechanics. So that lecture will be delivered by Adam Kordovsky. And then I'm hoping that instead of using this uh, product lifecycle management visiting lecture, there's going to be visiting lecture about artificial intelligence and mechanical engineering. That's I think it is something that you guys may like more than product lifecycle management. I don't know. Because I know that you guys are already taking the course that is organized by, by Dr. Ilka Donahue, Donahook. So you know the business already. But how much you know about artificial intelligence, maybe you're strong there too. But, uh, but I, we can have, let, tell a little bit about what might be the role, of what is already a role of artificial intelligence in, in mechanical engineering. Uh, there are stories about surrogate models, models based on uh, data, uh, and a little bit about how it can be used in a control application and so on and so forth. So hopefully that comes, and I hope that it's going to be delivered by Craig. I don't know if you know the Craig. His uh, real name is not Craig, but uh, Krehovs or Zeholvsk, uh, which is very, very difficult to pronounce. So I don't know if you can recognize his name based on my pronunciation. Craig, you know Craig. Okay, anyways, so let's get started from summarizing what we discussed a week ago. So this was, uh, this is uh, related to mass invariance. Remember the mass invariance are the components that couples description of deformation, which is based on finite term model and reference motion, which is based on multi-body system dynamics. So how well they are coupled are defined by mass invariance. Amazingly enough, this coupling, how loose or tight it is, the coupling can be defined by a user. And the user can do this selection by selecting which one of these mass invariants are kept active. If you select each of them to be active, it means that the coupling is as good as it can be, theoretically correct. It's my recommendation to use that. It comes with the minor drawback, which is related to computational efficiency. Because if you're going to use this full coupling, that's going to destroy a little bit about the computational efficiency. And you can enhance the computational efficiency by selecting some of them to be inactive. But then it becomes to be hard to know how much damage you introduce in the accuracy. That's practically impossible to know it. So better be safe than sorry. I keep everything there because the one thing that is important, even more important, usually more important than the computational efficiency, is accuracy. So if you compromise the accuracy, that can be a serious game for you. So that's the mass invariance. Contact. You remember that the contact uh, modeling consists of two steps. So it's getting started from the contact detection. So you need to know whether or not there is a possibility of the contact. And the easiest way to figure that out is there's a different version of uh, bounding box method. Versions difference from each other, the way the bounding, the box itself is put on top of the, the, the structures. But it comes with the different layers. So you have a big boxes. When you look at the big object, whether or not they can collide or whether or not they can have a possibility of contact. And if they do, then you're moving down to another level, all the way down to the drawing objects. And then you, once you see that, okay, they are colliding, then you need to do something. Choices are that you can use penalty forces, which you're introducing artificial, not artificial, but like a forces that are separating the contact, I mean, these drawing symbols away from each other. And that's going to be something that is called smooth dynamics. Or you can use a complementary, which is non-smooth, meaning that there is like inequality saying that these drawing objects, they can do whatever they want, except they cannot penetrate. So that's kind of treated in the same way that the constraint, except that it's a completely different way, 
but is uh, giving you a non-smooth dynamics. Smooth and non-smooth, they're good to be aware of that. Okay, so that's what we discussed a week ago. And now, uh, career counseling, part one. There's going to be a part two, maybe part three as well, but career counseling part, part one is here. So a uh, few general observations. And uh, something that I would like you to be aware of, uh, something that I recommend you to practice in future. First of all, keep in mind that the career is not going to be something that is a matter of a day or two, or a week or two, or a year or two. It's, a, it's a really a marathon. It's a big time marathon. So this is something that takes from here to next, for you guys, 55 years. Because it's seriously, because I don't think you're going to retire anytime sooner than 55 years from now. Because, you know, the retirement age is increasing all the time. So for you, it's going to be 120 years. <laughs> so, uh, so you just need to hope that, the, you know, the modern uh, medicine is getting stronger and uh, more effective so that you can work until, that you can have some time when you're retired. But just seriously, it's going to take a while. So there's a long period of time to think. And uh, of course, it's impossible to think from this to next 55 years or something like that. But I was thinking that it may be for you, it could be 50, 50 years, roughly that much. That's my estimation. Something like that. So I would say 50 years would be realistic uh, estimation. So it's hard to know what exactly going to happen this period of time, because there may be surprising elements that, I, that you cannot just predict. Something like... COVID is a good example about unpredictable things. There may be something else as well. But, you know, it's a good to keep in mind that this is not going to be something that is important for you for this month or next month, but 50 years from now. So that's the perspective that is a good to keep in mind. But the real perspective that is easier to consider will be five to 10 years, roughly that much. Now, something that I can see a lot to happen, particularly in the university, is that people are really rough to the way they are giving credits to themselves. Think about yourself. You already got the position in a ranked university. You know, there is a lot of universities that never find their way to university ranking. And this is that this LUT university is in a ranking. That is even very high, fairly high in a ranking. Uh, that's something that is already a great accomplishment finding a position in ranked university. That's the big deal. So every time something like that to happen, make sure that you can give a, a little bit of credit to yourself because you are full of accomplishment already. Already. Maybe there's going to be more, but um, any, every time something positive happens, make sure you can give a credit to yourself, whatever the easy way you want it to do it. That I don't know. But think about it. Think about what they there the way you want wanted to treat yourself. Now, something that I see that there's a little bit of problem in the students, this is a problem in all the students, not just the international students, but all the students in the mechanical engineering, is interaction, communication, and storytelling skills. It's all about telling stories. That is very important. And this is a skill you can learn like anything else. So you can learn to do chin-ups uh, many times, and you can be very good in that, but you can learn the communication skills as well. You can learn the storytelling skills. This is what is very important, because your hiring, believe me or not, will be based on how well you can express your case. It's typically an interview, and if you are not able to express your thoughts clear enough, then you're not going to find your way to be in an academic or in industry. So storytelling skills are very important. It's good to build this network too. And what bothers me a little bit is this, this uh, student union. They have these um, different chapters in student union. Like there's one chapter that is related to mechanical engineering. Uh, it's, uh, I don't remember the name anymore. But that seems to be a kind of national chapter. At least I heard that the way they communicate it is, in, is mainly in Finnish. So there's not so much communication in English. Is that correct or you don't care about this thing? Do you know this, local, this chapter related to mechanical engineering in student union? 
So you're not even aware of this thing. I think it is called kilt or something like that. Never heard it? You never heard it? You know the student union? Okay. So student union consists of uh, different chapters or different sub-teams. Each of the sub-teams are representing different departments in uh, university. And these different chapters are important because it, gets, it gives you a knowledge about what are the other students in a, in a department of mechanical engineering. And I somehow really would like to see in future, maybe it's going to be too late for you, but I really would like to see this chapter to be something that takes all the students somehow involved. And I would like to, that to be um, not that as uh, exclusive that it is at the moment. So it should be more inclusive because exclusive, the way I see that is at the moment is that they, if using Finnish language, I guess you guys are all off because I don't know how strong you are in Finnish. Not strong, right? Then why this is important because uh, you get to know not just your fellow students, but, but other, you, it gives you other network as well. And the networks are important because sometimes what happen, easily happens is that there is an open position in industry. It's like called like hidden open position, but it's never be announced. But they are, they see, oh, there's an open position. Hey, wait a minute. I know my friend from all the way from university. He is a perfect fit to this particular position. So let me call my friend. And that's the way the position is filled. So maybe never going to be a public announcement, but this kind of hidden positions. And you need to be part of the game of this hidden position as well. And the best way to get involved with that is a student, un student union. Student union is important. And I would like you to see that to be a little bit more exclusive. Inclusive, I'm sorry. Not the exclusive. It's already exclusive enough. Okay, so uh, that's something. Then, then a little bit about the cultural skills as well. You know, there are the certain behavior, certain behavior patterns in Finland and other countries too that is good you to be aware of. You know, something that, you know, uh, is uh, many of the things are kind of casual here, but there are certain things that are important. Just to give you an example, you know that being late in a meeting, not great here. That's something that is not going to be good. So you want to do everything except being in late. Because this is something that is people take it that's very seriously here. So that's good to be aware of. Uh, and again, you know, broad knowledge is, is a strong sort. Make sure that you have a knowledge about, like, like we discussed about later today, about these isotermetric methods and so on and so forth. So if you have heard about it, it helps. It helps. It definitely helps. So it's good to be very strong in one particular field, but even more important is to have a broad view of things. So you know about what it relatively means, you know, this and that, and how they are related. That is something, something important. And it's important to look five to ten years ahead, like I mentioned in the beginning. Now, this is what I see a lot. So people get confused about the details. So it's not so much about the details. Uh, an example about the details is uh, a single grade from my, a course. No one cares. I mean, you might care, okay? Oh my God, this is a nightmare if you score four out of five from, uh, let's say, simulation of mechatronic machine. Makes no difference. Absolutely no difference. Five four, three, they're all considered as a good grade. So uh, don't put too much effort to maximize things because what is important is to optimize things. Optimize in a way that sometimes getting grade five out of five needs too much work versus the credits. And your way or your thinking should be optimizing things. Make sure that things are in balance. Don't put too much effort to single subject matter, no matter how much you like it. Because again, the big picture is important. And the details, like even the grade, is still a detail. So don't get confused about the details. Uh, this. Okay, very good. Time management is, you know, there's a million different tools for time management. I think what matters is that pre-planning. So my days are very detailed planned, each of them. 
And then I'm even monitoring afterwards, like how well I manage to follow my pre-planning, because it's important too. And this is something that I, you know, not very detailed, but make sure that you have a like good planning for a day, for a week, for a month, for a year, and so on and so forth. And try to monitor it when you when you reach the certain point, then try to see how well you were able to follow your plan. And don't put too much in your plate. This is what I see a lot to happen. People are collecting too many courses. They're thinking that overdoing is the best way to go. No, it's not. No one is expecting you to overdo. No one is expecting you to make more credits than what is it you need to do? 180, 120, 120. So what was again? 20. Okay, so 120 is easy where you're going to get the master degree. So now if you're going to do 220, guess what degree you're going to get? Master degree. If you're going to get uh, 520, guess what degree? Master degree. So it's not going to give you anything more than a master degree. So make sure that you do the, what is needed, but don't overdo things. I don't know if you guys are planning to do more credits than needed. Definitely not. Yeah, it's good to keep that in mind. This is my time management. So this is my big picture. So I, I'm, uh, this is how I spend most of my days. Well, of course, it uh, ranges from one day to another, but there is a doctoral student research related to master level teaching, external funding, project planning, administration, and so on and so forth. You can make this kind of thing and then monitor that daily basis. Now comes very important thing. We discussed already about this master thesis topic. And you know that the majority of our graduates, they go to industry. And it's a good choice. It is a definitely a good choice. But at the moment, the life is such that if you're selecting this line to industry, it becomes to be increasingly difficult to go back to the academia. Further you go in your career, harder it is to come to back to the academia. And a little bit other way around too, quite a bit another way around too. So if you're selecting academia, you stay long enough in academia, it becomes to be difficult for you to find a position in the industry because these two lines are become to be increasingly separated. Uh, let me tell you what the big problem here is and why they are more separated than they used to be. That's simply because the academia, there is a heavy competition. You know, there's a, a lot of candidates and few positions only. And people are evaluated based on how much they have produced academic results. And academic results, one of the key factors is a publication. Now, that's journal papers, the scientific papers. Maybe there's another accomplishment as well, but mainly they would like to see how is your paper production. So in an interview before they say hello, they say, how is your paper production? And something that is called H factor. I don't know if you know that. Are you aware of the H factor? It's uh, something that tells how much your work is cited, how much you have produced, and how much it is cited. It's a single scalar value. So it's a one number that tells a little bit about, you know, how what is how long you've been in a business, first of all, and it tells how sucks roughly about, you know, how is your impact in your scientific community. Now, you take this uh, industry line, you are not going to make a single paper because industry is not making papers, but business and products. So they don't care about the publication. And now in academia, all they care, or let's say the major thing that they care is a paper and publication. And that's why they are so heavily separated. Knowledge may be same. You may have exactly the same knowledge in academia, that in the industry, another way around, but still it's going to be hard to travel back and forth. So I made these uh, arrows in a way that they saw roughly how is the situation. So maturity goes the industry. There's a certain number of work that is made here in academia. But then in academia, once you're done with your thesis, you'll go to industry. But there's a very thin box, thin arrow that stays in academia. Keep this in your mind because there's a bigger world out there comparing academia. I see that the many of the international students, they have this big dream that they want to stay in academia. Fine, that's okay. 
but there's a bigger part of opportunities available for you to, to keep this in your mind. All right, any thoughts so far? Not a big thought. Anything you wanted to say? No, nothing. Okay. Now here comes, a, you know, this is uh, pretty much the case in, in other aspects of your life than career as well. So if you're strong, if you're good at something, focus on that. Try to, you know, try to identify your strength. And I'm sure you already know where is your strength. You guys are all very strong because you wouldn't be here in otherwise. So you always are, you're already very good. But still, even the even you have a broad knowledge of things and you brought things you can do, make sure that you can kind of look at what is your strength. And each of us have a weaknesses as well. But don't let these weaknesses to slow you down. My great weakness is a dyslexia. That's what I'm suffering from my, well, this is something that if you have it, you're going to have it until you're going to die. So it's not going to be something that will fade away. It's going to be the rest of your life. So the dyslexia is a big problem of, of me. And it's, of course, it bothers me and it makes life difficult in a certain perspective. But I don't care. I don't care. I don't want to focus on that. You know, it's a problem that I'm going to carry with me today and from this on. And I've been carrying that already. You know, uh, these are close to 54 years. In May, it's going to be 40, 54 years. But I'm not focusing that so much. I kind of recognize that I have strengths that I'm focusing on those matters. So if you have a problem, you know, probably it's going to be only a handful of people that are having the dyslexia in a university. But if you have that, so what? Don't let that put you down. It's just a, you know, each of us have weaknesses, simple like that. So not that a big problem. All right. So uh, then, uh, of course, there is a way that you can um, you can go around these weaknesses. But but mainly, mainly my message to you is that uh, let not, let them not bother you too much, and do not try to be perfect. This is what I see a lot too. This is a particular problem when you do your thesis work. Some people are not able to give up the thesis work. They will improve it, improve it, improve it, improve it. And uh, this is not the purpose. It is t the purpose is to get started with something, close something. It doesn't need to be perfect. It is okay if it is good. That is very important. And make the realistic plan, schedule the scheduling, uh, make a 20% overhead, overhead. Try to get mentors, peers, good people, carry a counselor in your team. And this is already getting started here in the university. So you need to get to know professors. I know that you guys don't want to, you know, I don't want to go and discuss with them, my supervisor because he's busy and all that. Yeah, but still you need to do that. You need to do it because the professors are for you. You're the customers here. You know, this, uh, this education is not free. Somebody will pay it. It may not be you, somebody will pay it. So act as a customer. Don't act as a violent customer or something that is a too big a customer, but this is your possibility. So take it. Okay, so with that, so what, do we, what kind of comments do we have? No comments. And I see nothing from the chat either. So should we then move on to stress analysis or anything you wanted to discuss about the carrier so far? This was a part one. There is going to be follow-ups. Nothing. Nothing. Okay. All right. So then we're going to look a little bit about how is that we can get stresses out from multi-body models. This model here is not the multi-body model. And let me see if I can... Oh, this animation is not willing to run. This was a finite element based model. Finite element model that was describing a tire front suspension in total, and you were able to get the stresses out from this. Now, in the multi body, it's less straightforward to get the stresses and strain, but something that we are very much interested in. So, how we can do that in multi body system dynamics, that's what my, my next slide is about. Now, we have two choices to take here, to take the stresses out. 
because deformable bodies, remember what we're solving here. We're solving modal coordinates. Modal coordinates are related to nodal degrees of freedom, which are describing the displacement, deformations for you. But deformation is not the same than strain or stresses. So we need to be able to take ourselves from strain, I mean, this displacement to strains and from strains to stresses. That's something that we need to do. And how is it we can make it happen? Well, we can, have, we can make it happen in a two different alternatives. First alternative is that we take all the forces, including inertial forces, we take them from the multi-body system dynamics. And we exported them to finite term model. And then when, once we do that, then we recombining the deformation in finite term model. And once we do that, then we have all these post-processing tools that the commercial finite term software is offering to you in your use. So something that needs a quite a bit of um, work to do, but it gives outstanding post-processing tools that you can then later to figure out whatever you want. So that's one possibility. Another possibility is that you can use something that is called modal stress matrix, where you actually using these modal coordinates to get the stresses automatically. You can use that too. Problem is that not at all, all the commercial software are supporting these options because to make that happen, you need to know details about the final term theory. You need to know details about the final term and implementation. Sometimes commercial final term and software are unwilling to give that information out. So maybe you cannot use this. So then it leaves you no other way than using the option number one. So anyways, so those are the two choices. And let me look at the details of these two approaches. So here is the first approach. So you take these uh, forces. So uh, I don't know how well you see my drawing here in the below, but yeah, I have here a beam structure. And now the beam is loaded in a way that there is a joint here, which introduces the reaction forces. So this is gonna be a Lacran multiplier multiplied by transpose of the Jacobian matrix that is a reaction force. And then there is inertia forces, which uh, we know how those can be modeled. And then there may be external applied forces as well. You take each of them for every time step you're analyzing, you're exporting them in a package which is automized. So the automized way this information can be transferred. And then you're introducing load cases. You know, load cases are something that in a finite term model, you're solving most of the cases, you're solving this static equation where this is a displacement. This is a stiffness matrix. This is external applied forces. So you solving displacement, this one here, by inverting stiffness matrix and multiplying forces by inverted stiffness matrix. Now the load case is, is this guy here, this force vector. So you no need to invert the stiffness matrix, which is usually the most CPU consuming step to take. But instead you just do this matrix multiplication over over and over again. So eventually it's gonna be like this. So the force that will be a function of time gonna be gonna give you deformation that is a function of time. And then once you have that, then you're just using the post-processing tools that is offered by final time and software and you can get the strain. And from strain, you can get the stresses. That's it, that's how it works. Now, how this is possible? That's simply because it's assumed that forces in each of the time step we're solving here are in equilibrium, which is the case, which is the case. This is what the dynamic equation of motion are expressing for you. You just take a use of that statement, or you take a forces and you're conducting the static analysis as it is shown here. Still, static analysis, you have to introduce the boundary condition some kind. And this is where this method becomes to be difficult to use because boundary conditions should match joints you're using in your multi-body system dynamics. It sounds like easy thing to do, but it may not be in the reality because 
you know, there could be large rotations. Sometimes the tones are not the same all the time. They might behave differently depending on the configuration. So this is where you need to be super careful with. But you have to have a boundary condition because otherwise it's not going to work out. So the whole system works like this. You have like ANSYS software or whatever commercial software you wanted to use. You're extracting the information to model things using flexible bodies, which is uh, modes. Basically, it's a modes and uh, Aiken values and Aiken vectors. Uh, what you're going to get back is a forces. And then once you get them back, then you can calculate the stress histories. That's how it goes. Now, that was the step number one. Or let's say the opportunity number one. And opportunity number two is the one that is shown here. So this is an equation of motion that is used when you have flexible bodies. And look at the unknowns that is here. So there is a generalized coordinates that is defined in the reference condition. That's this coordinate system that floats with the body. And then there is this modal coordinates that is related to deformation. And then uh, reaction force is that is a Lacrange multipliers. What we could do is that we could simply take this guy here, which is this modal decrease of freedom, and compute the deformation based on this information. Nothing else but that information. Then we need a little bit of up additional information to be able to compute the strains and stresses. Additional information would be something, like I mentioned, needs the details about final term software. And details are this. You know, you get the vector of uh, not a decrease of freedom. What you can do then, they look like this. You can use something that is called kinematic matrix. Depending on the element type, this range is how it is computed. But basically, it's your same function matrix that is differentiated with respect to coordinates. No, uh, is it a line, 2D, or even 3D element? That really depends. So that's the way you can get this kinematic matrix that relates deformation and strain. But if you get an access to this one, then rest is a boilerplate. Rest is the downhill. Okay, so the B goes here. Then you're using this um, matrix of elastic coefficients, which is uh, very, very much known. And then you can get the stresses here. So this is already strains and this is stresses. This one here, which is a combination of things that you multiply that by the modal coordinates is called modal stress matrix. Very straightforward. Beautiful technique, but needs to get this kinematic matrix that sometimes commercial softwares are not willing to give away. All right. So these are the two different approaches. The first one is a CPU consuming because you're computing the deformation twice. You get started from this equation of motion. And instead of taking this one here, you're taking all the forces and inertia forces and you export them. And that's going to be awful lot of extra computing for you. But good news is that then you can get all these uh, post-processing tools to your use. You know, that you need to export the load. You need to set the boundary condition. That can be the most difficult step to take. And then you need to solve the displacement wise. Now, this second one is very straightforward, very simple to use, but not necessarily always the case. You might not get this information, even though that is that simple information, but you might not get it. All right, that's about it. Then uh, another short story. Why is, by the way, that you don't want to communicate with me today? Because it's, uh, it's what? You got depressed because of the snow or what? Why? Snow is a pitiful thing. Because we all love skiing, right? Yes? No? What? See, so you want to get sun? No, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Why don't we just enjoy this weather now? Makes sense. Yeah, okay. All right, have you, but, and it's a great opportunity still to do ice swimming. I don't know if you have tried that. Okay, I can give you a hint. There is a hole in the ice that is uh, located very close to city center. So in this, uh, this 
place that is called Mullesar. There is a hole in ice. Go and try. You're never going to forget it. It's going to be experience that gonna, you're going to carry the rest of your life. Positive, positive experience. Too risky. There's no risk. There's no risk of factor. It's just that you learn how to, to manage the pain and panic. Because as soon as you go that the water is all about the pain, a little bit panic too. Sounds fun. Okay. All right. All right. Then uh, a little bit about the fatigue. Now we're going to discuss about this course and relation to course uh, fatigue of well structures. Okay. Now uh, here's observations uh, relate to fatigue. And now keep in mind what I'm discussing here is related to welded structures. Welded structures are special case in a sense that in a welded structure there is two big problems which I'm going to introduce you momentarily. And these two big problems make sure that welded structures are very vulnerable. They get easily get damaged because of fatigue. Whereas non-welded structures they don't get damaged, fatigue damage so easily. Like if you think about the crankshaft or other components in your engine uh, in your combustion engine, they are not welded together. Uh, because they are not welded together, they fatigue life is better than comparing the ones that are welded together. But welding, when you look at the industrial applications, welding is a nice way to connect things together because it's very affordable, it's very versatile, and it can be made in a very different ways. So it's a beautiful method that there is no replacement economical feasible replacement for welding of course you can think that you can use some kind of like bolt connections and everything but seriously those are not a good option because the welding is still affordable simple and works fine works fine but you just need to understand that it comes with the major drawback and the major drawback is that it's vulnerable for fatigue that's why you need to consider welding as your friend and enemy friend in the sense that is affordable way enemy that you need to make sure that you're not introducing welding to any word that is a highly loaded section of your structure and i have an example where that has happened already and a little bit about uh, what we can learn from that but fatigue is our enemy and how is that we can fight against our enemy is that we need to know three things we need to be aware of the geometry which is typically the easy thing to be aware of we need to know the material, not difficult either, because we, we are speaking about the steel material or aluminium. Those are the basic two choices that you can see so much. And this is where you can see these welded structures, welded joints as well. And we're kind of limiting ourselves to these two options. So it's not so difficult. And it doesn't really matter so much about what type of the steel you're using. And I'm going to explain to you soon why it doesn't matter so much. So then uh, loading, but that is difficult. Loading is not at all easy to figure it out because loading condition varies a lot. And it's typically something that involves dynamics. So it's not straightforward to get the loading. Sometimes you need to struggle big time to get the loading. It used to be very much standard that still is a some part of it is the standard to measure the loading because you really don't know how your system is loaded, so you can use it, you can measure it by using strain gates, measuring stress history from your structure. That's one possibility. Some of these, uh, yeah, then, then you can get the good understanding about how is your structure is loaded and how is your loading history. That's what is needed. Okay. Now, durability is like, the factor that is defined by geometry and the material properties. Fatigue uh, is always a static statistic, statistical computing. So it's, you can get you may get the scalar value out of the fatigue analogy, but you need to understand that this is not when you can meet the fatigue failure for 100 percent certainty. But there is a statistical distribution when it might take a place. All right. And uh, like I said earlier, the loading is the most difficult thing to figure it out. Now, big problem in a welder structure is that there are two big problems, like I said. The first big problem is that whatever you're welding, 
it's a fair assumption to say that there is an initial crack in a, fat, in a welded toy. Welded toy is this particular corner. If you take a close look about this corner here, really microscopic view to this corner, you can see that there's a minor cracks, small ones, very small ones, very microscopic. And they doesn't really behave and they make no difference in a big picture of the structure, but they make a difference in terms of fatigue behavior. So these minor cracks is already there. There are techniques that you can get rid of this initial cracks. You can use a post-processing techniques like you can maybe hammering this uh, fatigue toy, or you can, uh, I mean, hammering you using, using hitting this, this particular corner by forces and it kind of smooth this crack away. You can heat it again by using, for example, tick welding. That's another possibility. But the big problem is this, that if you look at the how many, what's the length of the welded joints? Depending on your structure, the length could be very long. So it could be kilometers after kilometer of welded joint, and it becomes to be hard to use these pre-processing techniques to get rid of the initial crack. So again, safe assumption is to say there is a crack in your structure. No matter how new is your design or how new is your product, there is a already cracks when it leaves from the factory. So then it's just the handling the crack propagation. So how long it takes before the crack is big enough that it's going to kill the entire structure. That's what is, this is about. And final fracture, that takes like this much time and then it's too late. So there's nothing you can do it anymore. Everything is dominated by this. No time used for crack initialization because it's already there. No time used for final fracture because it's like this. But all the time being spent for crack Crowing, crack propagation. All right, so that's how it is. Ah, in welded structure, fatigue life is dominated by what? Now, this is going to be, now if we're not going to score 100% this case, big disappointment, I can tell you that. Very big one. Okay, let me take myself to Sokadiv. And I think, let me see. It's... Uh, sorry, I have not locked myself to soccer day, so just a second. Uh, here. So is it going to be 100%? Yes, it's going to be 100%. I agree with that. Okay, so in class squeeze. This one, all right. So uh, the questions are, in welded structure, the fatigue life is dominated by crack initiation, crack propagation, final fracture, easy. So let me take myself back here. So I'm going to take a look at this, this result momentarily. So let me, no, this was not the way to go. So let me do this. And then this. Okay, this is on and uh, we'll get back to the results very soon. Okay, that was the first problem in a welding structure. The second problem is this welding introduces awful lot of um, heat loading to structure, but locally. This is again locally, and this local heat loading is something that takes the residual stresses. The stresses that is left when you're done with the welding process to be very close to the, this uh, point where the linear material behavior becomes to be non-linear material behavior. You know, this is a curve you can, you've been seeing many times. So this is a curve where I, X axis is a strain, Y axis is a stress. You know that the steel material behaves in a way that if you load, introducing displacement and then strains to your structure, if you introduce them in these uh, 
linear release region, then uh, the deformation on the structure becomes to be uh, not permanently deformed. So you can load them, and once you take the force back, they becomes to be back to the original configuration. And then there is a plastic behavior, which is this behavior here. This is when you introduce in permanent deformation. So uh, then if you keep on loading your structure, you're moving here and here when you're going this direction, and when you take a load off, there's going to be deformation that much. That will not take away. So it's going to be structure bended or whatever is going to be the way of deformation that is not going to be going away anymore. Now, when you look at situation carefully, very much in the details. When you look at this welded toy, there's a residual stresses due to this high. Yes, sir. So we can uh, ask this question, uh, how uh, can the model and simulate correctly uh, plastic behavior in a material than a structure? Uh, it's because of the loading? Yeah, so usually the most problematic thing is to figure it out is a loading. You do know the geometry, you do know the material, but the loading is difficult to get. And the loading as a function of time, because this is a loading history. And the loading history is as long as the machine operation. That can be 20 years. And that's what makes it difficult. Of course, we cannot, we cannot afford to analyze structure for 20 years. So we need to do something faster than that. So we can use this experimental testing that is carried out by laboratory of steel structures, and that's where they speed up the loading. That's one possibility. Or we can compute it. And computing, we can know that, okay, this fatigue life is uh, by predefined work cycles or predefined days or hours or whatever is a unit you wanted to use. But you can make an estimate. Okay, this fatigue life is like 1,000, 100,000 hours or whatever is the time. And then it, there's a high chance that it's going to introduce a fatigue failure. But the, but the loading is difficult. This is not yet loading. This is still characteristic of fatigue joint. So the one of the, I said the one problem is that there is an initial graph. Another problem is that there is a high residual stresses. And because this high residual stresses, the structure is already having the high stress in the locally, very locally. This is pretty much where the crack is growing. There is a stress, residual stress, that is close to be plastic zone. That means very locally. And what it means is that if you started to load your structure, not necessarily having the full loading here, but you know just a little bit of loading, it always it already closed the plastic section very locally. But that's when the crack started to crawl the structure. Okay, the big user solution is that okay, why don't we check get the better material? more stronger, better steel, high strength steel perhaps, where this linear zone is much longer, so it's gonna be behaving like this. Not gonna help you, because again, residual stresses will go pretty much to this corner any time, no matter what material you're using. Again, when you started to loading, you're gonna move this plastic zone locally, very locally, but that's when the crack is started to crawl in your structure, okay? Was that the, what you learned from this course, uh, fatigue of welded structure well? Uh, how the fatigue happens and what is the characteristic of the metal? Actually, you are the center of fatigue because of the fatigue. And how fatigue, what is it uh, actually act? And what is the method for finding the fatigue welding? Structure? Right. But they, they mentioned that there are two big drawbacks associated to welded joints. Yeah. There's initial crack, high residual stresses. Yeah. 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 Nice. Well, that's going to be interesting, I'm sure. Okay, but that's how it behaves. So now, the fatigue life prediction goes like this. One way or another, you need to get the loading history. That's that's the uh, that stress that is a function of time. That needs to be a proper length. So maybe it needs to be in one hour, one day, or whatever you want. And once you get this loading history, something that is extremely important is to take a look at the, how much the stresses are fluctuating. So if the stresses are remaining high all the time, that's not so dangerous. 
because what matters is how much time you go up and down and how big is this difference between up and down. That's what matters. And there may be, uh, you know, several different sizes of it. And just to give you an example, you know, this shows like a work cycle that, that is uh, measured by the lock grain. So roughly it's looked like this. This is how you take a hold of the lock uh, because of the weight of the lock. Stresses go up here. And then what you're going to do then is that you're moving the lock and that's introducing small vibrations like this. Then you're releasing the lock and you're coming down like this again. Then you're taking another lock and it's going to be like this. That's going to be the stress history roughly. And that could be in total of, uh, let's say, one hour that you measure. Here comes the important thing. You need to measure what are the difference between the max and min. You also need to figure out what are the smaller fluctuations. And the way you can do it is something that is called rain flow analysis. It means that you put the water, or you kind of say that you have a container this shape, this shape that I was just drawing to you, all right? Then the next thing that you do is that you put the water to this container, so meaning that there's gonna be water from here. You know, this is a level of water. And then you introduce these small drillings, small holes in your structure. Like say, let's say that you put this drilling here, so water level will go down here, but not here. It reminds here, reminds here. This is going to be the first time that the water level goes down like that's going to be your first delta sigma. Then you're measuring these smaller ones too, which is another delta sigma as well. And you add them then, you're categorizing them. You say, okay, there is a, a delta sigma very big. There is like, uh, I don't know, 100 times delta sigma, very small, there are 1,000 times so on and so forth. You're collecting them, you're replacing them by something that is called equal and stress loading, like this one here. So they're causing equal and amount of damage. And then you're ready to move on to fatigue analysis. But the first step, most critical one, how you're gonna get this stress history. And that you can get from multi-body system dynamics. Now, when you, again, when you look at the very much in the details of your structure, there is a, Due to the geometry, if you make a finite term model of this kind of structure, due to the geometry, you see that there is a high rise of the stress very near to this where the crack is located. This is something that we cannot model using multi-body system dynamics because it needs too detailed model, which we cannot afford to do because of the computational limitation. We just cannot get this. So we basically have to rely on the stress level that is called nominal stresses. This is what keeps structure in equilibrium. This is what we can get. Rest, the stress increase due to the local geometry we can get by using um, pre-calculated tables or we can make a finite term model that is very accurate. So that's what's possible. So simulation, what we can do is that we can focus on this curve here so we can get the stress history. We can use this nominated stresses and that's how we can make a first estimation about the fatigue. It's a little bit of coarse, so it's not necessarily the most accurate, but it's okay estimation. But if you want to learn the details, you can get these other parameters that are describing the, how the stress is actually behaving very close to where the crack is growing by getting parameters needed from literature or finite element method. And then you can get, you can even use something that is called fraction mechanics. I don't know if you use a fraction mechanics in the course. Painful method. Yeah, it's... Okay, so the friction, friction mechanics is a high end. That's the most advanced, isn't it? Okay, I see. Oh, that's a good to know. Okay, but you learned about the hotspot as well. So the stresses that is a more accurate than the nominal stresses, but it's not yet in a level of what you need in a fraction mechanics. So the ranges, these are different methods are different because the way, what level of stresses you're taking into account. That's how they are different. All right, very good. Here's an example. This example is interesting because uh, 20, a little bit more than 25 years ago, I made my doctoral dissertation and it was about the loading condition of this crane that is still in our use, so it's still in our laboratory. 
and we measure the how is uh, stress is uh, computed once versus uh, the measured one. And uh, this was uh, the the computed one was based uh, on uh, multi body system dynamics, of course. We wanted to compute the stress history and compare that to the one that are obtained by using strain gauge. Strain gauge is a measurement to get the strain. So there are small sensors you clue to your structure, they're recording strains. All right, so that's what they're doing. All right, so this is a structure that I analyzed at the time. Okay, you know, this is a very messy picture, but if you take a close look about this guy here, it's me. You don't see that well, and you would not recognize that person either because it's me, but the much younger person. And uh, so it was me. This, by the way, you might recognize the place. This is in steel structure laboratory. So it was uh, bolted to the floor, and we were running this, and this was a scary thing because the crane is big, and the area is small. And the crane is fast, and again, area is small. So you can easily cause a, quite a bit of damage to this structure. And we measured the different kind of things. So let me show what I have here. So these are the strains that are, excuse me, stresses that are measured in this location and this location. You see that they are simulated and measured, and they are created fairly well. So that is okay. This estimation is okay. That you can then use to get these uh, using this rainfall analysis to figure out how much are the delta sigmas. Okay. And what we learned was that you know, there was a, a little bit of problem in this particular design. And the problem was that here, this area, here, you can easily imagine that this area is the highest load region of the structure. This is where you can see the highest stresses, all right? So uh, because of the load is here, so this is, can be almost considered as a cantilever beam. You put this in a cantilever like this, the highest stresses will be close at the joint, okay? Now, this is how low, this is where the high stresses are located at. And now you see what was the problem here. There is a small notch that were used to transfer uh, these hydraulic pipes from uh, pump that was located here to the cylinder that is located here and the cylinder that is located here. And now these connections, this, this attachment that make no difference where they are located, were accidentally located in a place that is highly loaded. So this is a warning message to you. So whatever you're welding something, you need to understand that, okay, this is where you can have a fatigue problem. So you want to take a welding away from the highly loaded areas as much as you can. And this is exactly what was not made here in this case. Case uh, example to you. Okay, so fatigue, a welded structure can be improved by using high or ultra high strength steel. This is something that is not so easy, using painting on other finishing techniques, using post welding treatment techniques. Post welding is, is a additional heating or hammering. This other finishing is like painting or another, you know, putting the chrome top of it or something. So what is the correct answer for this? Uh, let me check myself here. Okay, so is it going to be 100% in this case? So is it, you, you're absolutely sure it's 100%? Your yeah, first one. Yeah. Let me show this to you. initiation which is taking no time okay this exactly is a problem they demonstrate the problem about this YouTube there's a lot of good things about the YouTube like you can get this pre you know you can take a look at the lectures later but then there is another another problem because when I'm streaming I think there's a high temptation to look at news look a little bit about Netflix look a little bit about this and that and you may not focus on what I'm telling you and that can, this can happen then. But this is a human thing. That's what I do my, myself. So if there is a boring meeting, I don't pay attention. But I do something else. I reply my emails and everything. And then there's a question. They say, Aki, what do you think? Then I, what? <laughs> think about what? 
and then uh, that can happen. So it's a very human kind. But the problem of this YouTube. Okay, then we're moving on to the next one, which is uh, in. Uh, what the heck is this? This is completely big mess. Because I see, because I should change. Okay, I cannot use this one. I just cannot use because look at these answers are from. I mean, this one is a isotermetric analysis. Really? Yeah, that's uh, amazing because I moved this question from from down to up and somehow these answers were not following this movement. Don't know how this is possible. So we cannot use this. Cannot. Okay, let me take it off. Okay. Okay, large deformation will be the final topic. Which I'm not going to spend much. So it's only going to be 10 minutes, which is uh, we're getting started. And then we're going to close it. But anything, any comments, any, anything so far about career counseling, fatigue, stresses? What about career counseling number, part number two? Would you be willing to hear that too? Okay. All right. So we'll do it. Okay. So, so let me... No, no, this is not going to work out, so I need to do this. All right. So this is a large deformation. So here is a story that is related to a um, method that is heavily developed here in LUT University. And... Uh, Let's see how far I've, I'm able to go with this story. But it is a method that is... Uh, uh, what I'm about to tell here is a, is a method based on the absolute not a formulation. And why is that? Because this is the one opportunity, one possibility to describe large deformation in multi-body applications. So this is a finite element method that is not using modal reduction, but elements are used as they are. And they're having this special feature that they are capable to describe large translation and rotation, this rigid body of reference, translation and rotation with no problem. And that they can be also used to describe large deformation. Large deformation that can be, well, it's not really limited at all. So there is a, you can use that in clothes, airbags, tires, whatever you want, belts, wire ropes, it's possible to use there. All these applications, you can use this, uh, this method. But I don't want to spend much of a time with this method. And that's simply because this is a method that you can only find in a handful of a commercial software. So it's not well used in a community yet. Hopefully it will be later, but at the moment this, you can find it in the summer, some of the commercial software, but most of them don't have it yet. And that's why I'm going to just give you a highlight. What is this method about? And that's about it. Another reason is that uh, some years back, each of the professors, we got the letter from student union you, that you are part of it. And the student union letter was saying that, okay, we are unhappy about the performance of our professors because you're not telling anything about your research. Here it comes. This is the subject matter that more, many of the papers, if you look at our publication, there's a lot of papers that are related to this absolute not accordance formulas. So what's the deal with that? I'm going to shortly show it to you. And the background is this. You know, multi-body systems dynamics started with the rigid bodies, this case here. And then soon somebody recognized, okay, the model can be more accurate if deformation is accounted. And then came the floating frame reference formulation, which is a very powerful, still very heavily used method where you are able to describe the deformation, but small deformation. You cannot use it in a case of belts like this one here. So if you think about the belt here, belt is experiencing very large deformation. This is a special case where you cannot use the floating frame reference formulation. So you have to use something else like the absolute not a corner formulas. 
So that's an example where it can be used. And of course, it comes in with the different kind of the elements. So what's the special feature of the element or the method itself? The special feature is a special set of safe functions. Because remember, what we do in a finite term modeling is that we're describing displacement by using these safe functions. Oh, maybe it would be better to say, well, we can, we can, I can put it like this. We can describe the displacement like this by using nodal vector or nodal degrees of freedom and safe functions. And we can get something that is valid locally with respect to reference frame. And now what we're going to do in the absolute nodal corner formulation is that we're going to manipulate this guy here and this guy here such that they together can describe not just the deformation, which is a case of a conventional finite term method, but reference motion too. So that's going to be the method, that's going to be the trick behind. And when we're going to use this trick, then the safe functions together with the vector of nodal corners can be used to describe any particle within your element, directly as it is, nothing else needed. How this is possible? How you can create the safe functions like this? Well, it comes with the method based on vectorization. You know, it's a simple procedure, but it's a little difficult to understand. You know, the conventional beam element that we look a couple of weeks back, that consists of uh, a total of four degrees of freedom, is like this. So the four degrees of freedom is like motion in a transverse direction, y, which is here too, so y1, and then the slope, which is a tangent of the midline here. So those are the, and the tangent of the midline can be computed as a parcel y2, parcel x. y2 is a midline description here. So what we do in this vectorization, you know, this is a scalar component, this is a scalar component. So instead of using the scalar components, we're going to use a vectors. So the R, which is now the, still the midline here, the midline that consists, that is in a planar case here, will, de, will be differentiated with respect to coordinate x. But R here is a vector. And because it's a vector, it gives this special feature that we looked earlier. So there's a safe function multiplied by a vector of nodal corners, and that together can describe reference motion and deformation. Okay. Now, with that, I'm going to close it for today, and um, we're going to take a look about the, how is the rest of the story, and there's a lot of funny stuff about this and that. There's going to be these isogeometric things because this is, becomes to be close to the isogeometric analysis. How is this related to that? We'll tell you... Actually, I'm not going to tell you next week because next week is going to be Adam, but week after that. Okay, so what do you guys say? I still want to get your confirmation. Is it okay if it is um, not product life cycle management, but artificial intelligence? So you prefer artificial intelligence. Good. Very good. All right. So with that, as promised, I need to go and have a lunch. So I'm uh, closing for the day. Uh, any comments? No, no comments. Okay, guys. See you on... Um, Tuesday, but it's, we actually don't not gonna see you on Tuesday because I will be um, someplace else. But Adam will be delivering his things about the biomechanics, animals and humans. So it's gonna be a lot of fun, a lot of fun for you. All right. So uh, let me do this. So let me close my stream.